Welcome to an hour of HealthMade Radio. HealthMade is a community for natural health seekers where we educate people about common health conditions and share extensive research on the most effective natural health treatments and promote legislation that protects our health freedoms. A core concept belief is in the innate intelligence and healing power of the body. And if properly supported spiritually, emotionally, and nutritionally, it can find its way back to health. HealthMade Radio will bring information from integrative health experts throughout the world. Check us out at healthmade.co. Health is what you make it. I'm Dr. Mark Carlfeld, and I will be your host. Today's guest is Dr. Walter Longo. Dr. Walter Longo is Professor of Gerontology and Biological Sciences and Director of the Longevity Institute at the University of Southern California, one of the leading centers for research on aging and age-related disease. Dr. Longo is also the Director of the Longevity and Cancer Program at the IFOM, Institute of Molecular Oncology in Milan, Italy. His studies focus on the fundamental mechanisms of aging in simple organisms and mice and how these mechanisms can be translated to humans. The Longo Laboratory has identified some of the key genetic pathways that regulate aging in simple organisms and has demonstrated that the inactivation of such pathways can reduce the incidence of progression of multiple diseases in mice and humans. Dr. Longo has received numerous awards for his work, the 2010 Nathan Schock Lecture Award from the National Institute on Aging, the 2013 Vincent Cristofalo Rising Star Award in Aging Research from the American Federation for Aging Research, the 2016 Merch Professorship, the 2016 Bahab Professorship, and so on and so on. And in 2018, he was named by Time Magazine one of the 50 most influential people in healthcare for his research on fasting mimicking diets as a way to improve health and prevent disease. He's the author of The Longevity Diet and the two Italian books, At the Table of Longevity and Longevity Begins in Childhood. So, Dr. Longo, it's such a, an amazing honor to have you on the show today. And, and the research that you're doing, it's so groundbreaking in the way that we are able to use diet to impact how we live, uh, how we work on stem cells and re in relationship to cancer, to uh, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, neurodegenerative disease. What what made you move into this direction? What 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 caught your eye? What caught your interest to to think that solutions were were to be found in this area? I think that um, the, I basically started uh, uh, with Roy Walford, and Roy was uh, the leading person in the world back in uh, 1992 um, on nutrition and longevity, and so. Having a, a mentor like Roy obviously um, made uh, a big difference on me. And, um, and so since then, I, I always thought that uh, nutrition was going to be at the center of uh, longevity regulation and also health span regulation. And uh, it was just a matter of uh, finding how to um, implement what he and others had uh, found um, but eliminating lots of the problems, and also I think moving the science ahead. In, in back in the early '90s, uh, there was a, some some data on uh, on what may have caused the, uh, the regulated the aging process, but uh, they they um, we did, we did not know any of the genes that regulate aging, and so we and others uh, uh, focused on that first on the genetics of aging, to then go back to nutrition. So. I, I essentially had a, a, about 10 years where I just focused on genetics. And then when once we had known enough about the genes that regulate the aging in simple organisms, as well as mice and humans, then uh, the, I went back to uh, nutrition and, uh, and focused on uh, the, the nutrients that controls the genes that control aging. So in, in your words, how would you describe aging? What, what takes place during the aging process? I, 
I uh, um, describe it usually as a um, increase in dysfunction, uh, increase in damage, and a decrease in the ability of a system to uh, uh, perform at, at its youthful uh, level. Um, so in, in most cases, that's what you see uh, during aging. Um, and then if you look at it from a more evolutionary standpoint, then um, I, I talk about longevity programs and, and the existence of a program uh, in all organisms or multiple programs in all organisms, each of which is um, set for a certain length. So, for example, a mouse has a, a youthful program that lasts about, say, 18 months, and but people have a youth, youth program that lasts uh, 40, 45, 50 years. And, uh, but then they have a, um, a health span program that, that can last 60 or 70 years in, in, in humans and maybe, uh, you know, two years in, in mice. Um, so then um, the longevity program really has to do with what the, the genes and the, the, the genes uh, changes, like epigenetic changes particularly, um, have set, have preset for that particular organism and um, and so that's really what we've been focusing on. Uh, how do you um, so if you took a mouse, uh, how do you go from from the two years uh, to the you know 60, 70, 80 years, um, two years from for a mouse to the 80 years for for a person? And that's really um, what we've been focusing on. And and you, I know you've been studying starting first with very simple organisms you know, like like yeast, and then. And moving on to mice and, and then trying to translate it into to humans. Do you, do you feel that what you're learning from the simple organisms that that translate well into more of a complex system like a human being? Yes, I, I think that, that uh, lots of people underestimated um, simple organisms, uh, maybe because there was a more of like a top-down or a medical view of everything. And um, and so now I think we we're starting. Lots of people are starting to appreciate that, you know, a baker's yeast uh, or even a bacteria has been around for as long as we've been around, and um, or longer, in fact. And uh, uh, and so that um, it's not so much about details, but it's about general rules and responses. So, for example, starvation response. I. I started working on starving bacteria back in the early 90s and then starving yeast. Um, and, uh, and you start seeing a, a trend, and not just a trend, a, a very precise uh, behavior or response that these organisms uh, uh, do uh, have in, in, when, when, they, when the nutrients are removed. And so I think you, you, start, in, uh, so you start to appreciate the fact that there is probably very powerful um, uh, roles of these, uh, you know, starvation moments in all organisms, and all organisms had to deal with starvation periods. And when they enter a starvation period, they have to respond in a very coordinated way um, by doing lots of things that uh, is not surprising and being conserved all the way from from bacteria to to human. I mean, obviously, you have to understand the complexity, so it doesn't mean that everything that you find in bacteria, you're going to find in humans. But we're looking for the, the big picture, if you will, and uh, how do you utilize this ability, of, for example, of a bacteria to become very resistant to everything uh, once it starts? And uh, how do you use that in people? And, and for example, the first use for us was uh, chemotherapy. Right? So I thought because bacteria and yeast when starved, become protected against almost everything that you can uh, expose them to. And uh, I thought, what would be the, the one toxin that we're more, most likely or more likely to be exposed to? And so the, that's how we started our work on, on chemotherapy, uh, differential stress resistance. That's fascinating. We're going to take a quick break. Yeah, because I'm, I'm really curious in regards to the chemo. And obviously, since cancer is uh, uh, battling to become the, the number one uh, leading disease, you know, cause for death here in the United States. So that that's becomes a very relevant topic. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm here with Dr. Walter Longo.
Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Dr. Walter Longo. He is uh, probably one of the leading longevity experts in, in the world, you know, making you know, huge strides in what we can do in order to, uh, uh, to battle all these diseases that we're living with and our you know, autoimmune disease, cancer, and so forth. So you were talking about these these organisms and and how you were using fasting or or I would say starvation almost in order to be able to protect them against chemicals and and one of the chemicals that we look upon as as human beings most of us are going to be exposed to at some point in our life due to you know the rise in cancer and being then chemotherapy so. So tell me, because we and we have the mindset that you know we, we need to nourish and support and give nutrients and and that is how you create a strong body. But you're saying the opposite of actually fasting and starving uh, creates more resistance and protection. Yes, essentially um, that's why we we have to look at evolutionary biology and and uh, but we go all the way to the clinical trials. But the, um, the idea is that when an organism is, is under starvation conditions, it uh, has to become very protected because it cannot afford to become damaged. And, um, and this seems to be conserved, meaning that it seems to be true all the way to humans, although uh, the, the human data is not conclusive yet, but certainly the initial clinical trials are, are suggesting that this effect is conserved. And, um, um, instead, the, the dividing cells, their scope is really to divide as, as rapidly as possible or, you know, divide rapidly enough. And, um, and uh, if something gets damaged, when you have lots of division, the way that the, the cells handle the damage is, to just, uh, is just by eliminating the damaged ones, right, by apoptosis and other processes. So that's why um, when, you, when you starve a system, uh, whatever is left alive has to become protected because that uh, that cell, set of cells that have been starved, uh, eventually are going to be exposed again to, to food. And when they return to the normal nourishment, they have to be fully effective. And they cannot have uh, any alterations that will negatively affect uh, um, the, the, their ability to function but also the ability of the organism to reproduce. So uh, does the, uh, the term autophagy uh, come in into play in, in this relationship, meaning if you starve in organisms, uh, that it then starts to kind of break down more of the unwanted cells and, and damaged cells, uh, does that play a role in, into that, uh, in that process? Well, autophagy, uh, we think, is just a, a part of a much bigger program that is relevant more than the, in their resistance uh, to stress, is relevant in the, uh, in the process of breaking down and rebuilding, right? So, so autophagy um, is, uh, is basically um, the, the uh, requirement or, or something that is required in a cell um, when it starves. Uh, why? Because it cannot sustain um, the normal function. And, um, and, and so, and it cannot sustain all the components that are normally requiring energy. So to save energy, it starts breaking down itself. And also, it eats itself, right? So the cell eats itself uh, for the sake of uh, to obtain energy and, and components that, that it needs, building blocks, right, the bricks. So, yeah, so autophagy is just uh, one part. I mean, lots of people think it's the only part. It, it absolutely is not, but it's one part of, of many different uh, processes that, uh, that have the job of breaking things down um, and then, uh, you know, to focus on the on the good things that are working properly, and they can get you through the starvation period. And and during that process, does it tend to be then that the the weaker cells or more damaged tis- tissues gets broken down before the healthy tissues during that when when that takes place? 
Yeah, so we, we started, um, I mean, autophagy is really a process, an intracellular process. But we, we uh, published several papers indicating that, for example, cancer, right? So a cancer cell is going to be preferentially targeted by the starvation condition. So the, um, the, the starvation basically puts a challenge Put the challenge on the uh, on the cells. So, in, in in regards to like you mentioned with the uh, autophagy, that it it tends to go after then the the weaker tissues first, and and cancer then being a kind of a prime example uh, where it it really can't it, it needs a lot of energy, and uh, if we then use fasting, uh, does that then favor the the cancer, or does it favor the normal tissue using fasting? Yeah, so we think that it's not just about autophagy. Again, autophagy is just a, a, a one component, not, not necessarily a um, a component of the pro of the master program. So probably, and we don't know for sure yet, but probably the fasting represented a moment where you activate all kinds of mechanisms, including autophagy, to get rid of, of uh, damaged components. So, for example, a cancer cell or a precancer cell uh, would be viewed as a non-responder, a damaged, co- a damaged component. Why? Because the system is starving and the cell decides to rebel against the orders and continues to grow. Of course, uh, that cannot be allowed, right? So why? Well, you know, can you imagine if a group uh, uh, of people were starving and someone decided to, to just keep eating like um, the food was abundant? So, you know, in, in billions of years of evolution now, probably the system, all systems, develop something to get rid of rebels, right? And, and, and Because the rebels will interfere with the ability of the organism to, to survive. And, um, yeah, so then... We showed that for cancer cells, we showed it for autoimmune cells, and, uh, and we showed that this, this uh, starvation then followed by the feeding period is really able to um, uh, break down all kinds of uh, damaged components, and then during the refeeding, uh, use stem cells and other uh, working parts to rebuild. Right? So, and it makes sense, right? So now imagine whether it's a bacteria billions of years ago or is uh, people 20,000 years ago, it would make sense that uh, if, you, if you were someone 20,000 years ago and, and you had to undergo four months of, of very little food, it would make sense that you would conserve all the good cells and kill all the bad cells and um, and then once food becomes available, then you re-expand and using the, the good stem cells and other uh, build, you know, basic uh, templates so that you can go back to the normal uh, size. So with, with that, I mean, we, we have all these different diseases on the rise, like I mentioned, cancer, autoimmune, cardiovascular, and, and so forth. So... Do you feel that some of these reasons why they are on the rise, because, I mean, obviously we are a country where we're a society now that's not starving. I mean, we have more food now than we've ever had before. So do you, do you feel that that is kind of driving these diseases forward because we are not allowing our body to kind of clean up dysfunctional cells and tissue? Yeah, that's almost for sure. I saw... So the, the, historically, uh, we would eat, I mean, not everybody did the same, but let's say um, uh, at least a, a, a part of, of, of human beings uh, could overeat during the summer, uh, accumulate fat, and then uh, and during the winter or certainly during periods where there was no food, utilize the stored fat. We, we, we still see it with the emperor penguins in, in the South Pole, we see it with the grizzly bears in North America. Uh, so, you know, it's already, it's, it's still out there, this, this type of behavior, you know, gain weight and then burn it uh, when, um, burn the, the accumulated fat. When um, there is no food available, there's very little food available. Now, of course, um, you know, we have part A without part B, uh, we gain weight and then we keep eating the same way all year round. 
Um, and of course, that's not uh, that that doesn't work. And, and and not surprisingly, now in the United States, we have over seventy people, seventy percent of people overweight, and Europe is, is following very closely. Uh, and pretty soon, the whole world is going to be overweight. Yeah, we're going to be overfed and and uh, have all the health conditions that come along with that. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm here with Dr. Walter. Longo talking about anti-aging and what you can do to live longer and healthier. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Dr. Walter Longo. So one of the things that you mentioned in regards to the uh, fasting and starvation is the resistance of healthy cells to things like chemo and other type of chemicals. So you're, you're saying that in order for an individual to health-wise be protected, it is better if they are starving and fasting. Yes, uh, it's better. Well, I mean, I I don't know that we can say that yet. But certainly starving is a big word for a cancer <laughs> patient. Um, so we're saying that now there are uh, carefully designed what we call fasting mimicking diets. And this was thanks to the, in part to the government, U.S. government funding and the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute on Aging, basically saying, um, why don't you develop uh, diet program, dietary programs that are equivalent to, to water-only fasting so that the patient doesn't really starve and that you minimize potential side effects. Uh, but at the same time, you generate a starvation response that would benefit normal cells and kill cancer cells, particularly when you have, let's say, uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, hormone therapy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's what we've been focusing on. Uh, first, we demonstrated this in mice, and now we have lots of clinical trials. Uh, four of them have been published. Now there's going to be another three published in the next uh, six months or so. And, um, yeah, so it seems to be working very well, both at the level of, of uh, protecting uh, normal cells and also in, uh, in making the uh, therapy work very well with uh, cancer cells. So, because uh, when you're dealing with an individual battling cancer, I mean, one of the biggest things that you're always concerned about is them losing too much weight. And so then to implement something like... Um, yeah, it's starvation or, or fast. You know, yeah, starvation, like you're saying, it's a strong word. But uh, staying away, from, abstaining from food for a certain period of time to uh, maximize the impact of the chemotherapy and then also increase the resistance of healthy cells to the impact of chemo. Uh, that it, it's still still sustainable. I mean, you, it, uh, patients do better staying away from food around chemo. Um, it, it's not detrimental to them? No. The, the initial trials uh, show that it's not detrimental. Uh, the latest one was published by Charité Hospital in Berlin, and they showed that women that um, uh, did a, a fasting mimicking diet for, I think, four days uh, uh, in combination with chemotherapy, they had a better quality of life compared to uh, to those that received the chemotherapy in combination with standard uh, uh, diet. Uh, so yeah, all, all the trials so far are, are positive, indicating that uh, this is not a problem, uh, and, and there are going to be more uh, be, being published soon. That does not mean that everybody can can go undergo a fasting mimicking diet. Um, there are some uh, patients that we exclude from the trials, uh, and usually are those that uh, lose more than 5-10% of their body weight and don't regain it back before the next cycle. And so usually those are excluded from the, the trial or they are asked to wait and, and, um, and wait uh, uh, one cycle and see if they regain the weight and then they may you know, skip a cycle and then continue on the next, uh, on the next uh, best in making that cycle. So let let's say an individual is supposed to have chemo chemotherapy. You know, let's let's say it's on a on a Monday. You know, they're supposed to have chemotherapy. How how would be the best way then for them to prepare themselves for that that um, chemotherapy, uh, and uh, 
yeah, when when should they start fasting? When what should they eat? I mean, how how should they behave themselves yeah, to I, maximize that impact? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I uh, we decided a long time ago that improvisation is going to do damage not just to cancer patients but to to normal patients. And and um, you know, I started a company um, for disclosure purposes. Um, I, I donate everything to to charity. Uh, so I really don't make a penny out of any of this. But I thought that uh, it's really important that we use the, the medical standard that was generated by the FDA, et cetera, et cetera, and, um, and that we do not allow the patient to go home and sort of cook it up, you know what I mean? Because uh, um, that's probably going to cause, once you get away from the doctors and once you are able to uh, make your own recipe, uh, probably going to do much more damage than, than good. So what we're saying is that, you know, very, very soon, uh, hopefully, um, you know, within the next three or four months, uh, there's going to be uh, products that are going to be relatively inexpensive and that, um, and that the oncologist can consider. Uh, and those are going to be the clinically tested fasting mimicking diets. And, um, and again, uh, at least my part of it, uh, and, and which is the majority of the company, uh, goes to charity. So I think it's, uh, it's also a good cause uh, for the cancer patient to, to, uh, uh, to, to buy this, meaning that it's going to allow us to do more clinical trials, uh, assistance to patients, which we're doing with the foundation, and, um, and uh, you know, education in school, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, so I, I would say um, don't improvise. Um, if you can't wait, I mean, talk to your doctor. We're always willing to uh, help uh, oncologists uh, uh, do what they can now. Uh, but if you can't wait, uh, I think within six months, uh, this uh, cancer product is going to be out. Uh, and I'm fighting to, for the company to keep it a, as inexpensive as possible. And, um, and I think that's the way to go, um, you know, because it's, it's now being tested on, I think, something like three or 400 patients. Uh, many different types of cancers. So, yeah, that, that is a good way to do medicine uh, versus, uh, you know, go home, here's the recipe, uh, good luck, you know. Yeah, exactly. And, and, I, and I, I think it's extremely admirable what you're doing. You know, the, uh, whatever money you make on all your books and, and your programs, that that goes back into research in these areas, which is, uh, which is vital. You know, this is... From my point of view, this this is true research, and and, uh, and so I, I think that is quite amazing. Uh, the, the yeah, and also I think we, not, not only research, we also now we're going to start a clinic in Los Angeles uh, with doctors and uh, you know assistants because lots of the patients that have advanced diseases. I mean, people write to me every day, and you know, and we have a, a, a clinic in Italy, and now we're going to start one in Los Angeles, but we need much more money. To maybe have one everywhere in the United States or around the world, and 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 the idea is really to think in a much faster way, much more more molecular, evolutionary, and and you know have doctors and molecular biologists working side to side to uh, try to intervene uh, much more rapidly in, in a more sophisticated way to help patients. You know, so this is really uh, non-existent. Uh, I mean, there are integrative medicine uh, clinics, but but I think we're nowhere near where we should be if somebody has a, a big problem, whether it's cancer or Alzheimer or cardiovascular disease, uh, we should be able to intervene uh, um, in, with a team that is much more uh, equipped to, to go fast and get it right. Yeah, that's wonderful. And cause currently, I mean, be- before you have this this new product or you know, the, the foods that's coming out within the next few months, I mean, the research that you've done is that uh, like things like 48 hours prior to chemo, somebody goes on a water fast and they do better with the chemo that way, correct? Uh, well, we've done a small trial at USC. It was a 48-hour uh, water-only fast uh, uh, before chemo and 24 hours after, and that showed some promising effects. But uh, it took Five years to finish an 18 patient trial, and that just an indication of the oncologist's unwillingness to put patients on water only, and the, and the patient's unwillingness to do water only fasting. 
Um, and then I think we also learned how water-only fasting is really not appropriate for the great majority of people. It doesn't mean that people cannot do it. That's not the issue. The issue is how many times you're going to do this and uh, how long is it going to take a cancer patient to get hurt by the, this combination of, let's say, water-only fasting and radiotherapy or chemotherapy, maybe because they're driving and they feel too tired and, and their salts are too low. Et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, so we, we moved away from it. And uh, I have to say that um, yeah, once we standardized the fasting making diet, um, then uh, we saw very, very little uh, major side effects, grade three, grade four side effects in the clinical trials. And so that's very good news. You know, when you get to three or 400 patients and you start seeing this, uh, this great response and really very few patients, for example, losing muscle mass, very few patients having to be um, excluded from the trial because of losing weight. Uh, very few patients um, with unexplainable side effects. Uh, so, yeah, that's very good news when you get to those numbers that, um, that it looks so positive thus far. Um, so I think that uh, that's, that's the way to go. And you, st um, and you still were getting the same results. Yeah, we, we get, uh, well, we knew we were going to, you mean the same results as water-only fasting? Yes, yes. Me yeah, well, we knew that we were going to get the same results from, from lots of mouse studies so with the fasting making that was as effective, if not more effective than the water-only fasting. And, um, yeah, now I think that almost unanimously all the hospitals, we have, I think, over 40 clinical trials now ongoing or about to start all over the world. And, um, you know, I think that the, the overwhelming majority are saying, uh, give us the fasting making diet because uh, um, that's the way to go. Yeah, that's the way to go. Wonderful. We're going to take a quick break. They're also oh. saying, I think, keep it, keep it inexpensive. You know, don't, don't have a $1,000 or $2,000 diet. You know, don't, 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 don't get to these high expenses because uh, whether it's reimbursed or not, it, it, neither the government nor people can can afford the, you know, additional big bills. And so, yeah, that, that, I'm really fighting very hard for that. I, I don't control that, but certainly as a professor, I'm fighting, I'm fighting to, to keep it uh, uh, reasonable for the company, but also for the patients and, and, and whoever is going to reimburse it. Yeah, you, you want it achievable and sustainable. I mean, otherwise it doesn't make any sense because it, it'd be hard to implement at a larger scale. Yeah, if it's not sustainable uh, for the company, the company is going to disappear, and then you're going to have nothing like you had before. And uh, uh, then you're going to have lots of improvisation, and then people that improvise, as we've seen over and over, they get hurt. And then the medical community jumps on it and says, see, uh, you improvised, and that patient did that at home, and now that patient end, end, ended up uh, with the severe side effects or whatever, or even death. And then the whole thing goes away. Yeah. Uh, because there is no way to standardize it. There is no way to control it. There is no way to fix it because you don't know what to fix. You know, so if somebody is hurt by whatever they improvise, well, how do you know wh what they did? You know, um, so, yeah. So I think it's really, I, you know, sometimes people criticize me uh, for doing this. And it's okay. You know, I, I thought about it very hard and I tried all kinds of ways. But uh, in, in the end, I realized that that's, the only way that I can think of uh, of getting this uh, done. Yeah. yeah, that's wonderful. We're going to take a quick break. I'm uh, here with Dr. Walter Longo. You're listening to Health Made Radio. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with longevity expert Dr. Walter Longo. Uh, so we've been talking then about the, the fasting mimicking diet. What does that look like? I mean, how is that different from everything else that's out there? We, we got intermittent fasting, ketogenic, you know, paleo. I mean, what, how, is, how is fasting mimicking diet different? Well, fasting mimicking diet, first of all, is not something that you do every day. Um, and it, it's something on a need-to-do-it basis, uh, meaning that somebody could do it twice a year, could do it three, four, ten times a year. Um, and that uh, usually um, a, uh, a doctor or nutritionist or dietitian would uh, awfully make the decision people can do it without it if they're healthy. Uh, but uh, if there's a disease involved, they have to talk to a specialist. And, um, yeah, so it's a little to do with uh, all the other things that you, that you mentioned. Uh, 
uh, which are in most cases chronic and continuous, you know, with this alternate, uh, with there is, uh, you know, 16-8 or, 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 or 5-2 or, or ketogenic diet. Uh, these are uh, really lifestyle, right? So the fasting making diet is not a lifestyle. Uh, it's about um, really a medicine or an intervention that you do once in a while when problems have accumulated. And the problem could be that you're insulin resistant. It could be that you've got too much abdominal fat. It could be that, uh, um, you know, lots of the cells have, have, have now um, been damaged and now you, you have a systemic inflammation. I say CRP is elevated. Um, so these are all things that, um, you know, we've, we've shown in the clinical trial um, so that uh, if you have people that had high cholesterol, uh, cholesterol was reduced. People that had the, were pre-diabetic, most of them returned to the normal state. People that were that had systemic inflammation, in most cases, the inflammation went back to to the normal range or, or below the normal range. Uh, so yeah, so I think that the fasting making diet is really medicine, if you will. Um, I will argue the most powerful medicine there is, um, meaning uh, you know exploiting both the fasting powers, but also the mimicking powers. You know, let, don't underestimate. How important, as we've shown in the paper this year, uh, how the prebiotic, the vegetables, the prebiotic ingredients in the vegetables were essential, at least in mouse models, uh, to drive the uh, the effects on on, um, on uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, so gut uh, autoimmunity. So it wasn't just the water-only fasting. In fact, the water-only fasting only worked about health as well as the fasting mimicking diet, suggesting that. Um, you know, the, the having positive ingredients, um, such as the vegetable containing the prebiotic that change the microbiota, change the, the, the intestinal flora, um, the, those are, are key uh, in addition to the, the, the absence of, of nutrients. So um, this is why now we're starting to call it a fasting mimicking and enhancing diet because they also have an enhancement component. Um, all uh, respectful of, of technology on one side. You know, so, for example, we know the protein control, the IGF-1, they control uh, TOR. So we use protein in, in, you know, to control these genes that control aging. On the other side, we know the uh, sugars control PKA. So we use sugars to control these other pro-aging pathways. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we use the lack of sugar or the lack of protein, essentially, mostly. Um, but also we play with that because in, during the refilling period, uh, the same, the, the lack is no longer appropriate, and you ha- you need to have sufficient level of amino acids and sugars to rebuild the system, right? So it's really, you know, again, what we call nutrient technology, and uh, and it's really based on the understanding of um, of the composition of food, and now this composition affects different. Uh, um, functions in the in the human body. So, if if you would give kind of an overview of the main principles of the fasting mimicking diet, you know, when when you have, I mean, obviously this is just to be done at a period when you need it. This is not a continuous diet to be done every day. But what what would it look like for an individual? Let's say that's dealing with cancer or dealing with autoimmune condition or uh, some inflammatory bowel condition. What what would it look like uh, so that a person kind of have a feeling of what it is? Yeah, they, they, they will all look different, but they will all have similar properties. So they will all be low protein. They will all be uh, full of vegetables. They all have uh, high fat, but they wouldn't be the same fat. So, for example, for autoimmunities, we, we will not use nuts. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for um, uh, normal people and also for uh, neurodegenerative cl- clinical trials, we do use nuts. And, in fact, we use high levels of nuts. And, and um, so, yeah, high, high fats, uh, good fats, uh, low protein, low sugar, relatively high carbs for certain fasting-making diets, but lower carbs for others. So for the regular people out there, we have a, a fairly high carbohydrate level, but all, mostly coming from vegetables. Uh, but uh, for some other uses, we are now lowering the carbohydrate level. So it's not a, it's a ketogenic diet, but it's like that's a, 
uh, high fat and high both high fat and high carb. Um, and um, yeah, so those are, are the features that for autoimmunities, for example, we go to seven days. Uh, for um, for uh, uh, regular people and for diabetes and and can, uh, it's, it's five days for uh, um, cancer is four days four or five days we have the two different versions yeah so in each case we're trying to achieve different uh, changes we have different requirements we have different patients and uh, and we have to adjust based on uh, on their needs. So uh, when you say cancer, four or five days, so would those four or five days be around on the, the chemotherapy session or radiation session, or when, when should those four or five days be? Well, it depends, right? It depends. Uh, so uh, for chemotherapy, they're definitely around. So there's, uh, say, three in the clinical trials, we're doing three days before of the FMD, one day after the chemotherapy. Um, but uh, now in the in the trials, for example, that, uh, where we're looking at uh, uh, immunotherapy, um, we uh, are doing different versions, and in some cases we alternate, right? So we don't want to intervene at the same time with the fasting-making diet and, and, the, and the other therapies. Uh, so it could be um, quite different based on the, on the type of therapy. But yeah, chemotherapy would be good, um, and... Um, and uh, all the drugs that be with, but sometimes, particularly those that, that affect the immune system, uh, the, the, the initial decision at least is to alternate to make sure that we don't interfere with, uh, with the, uh, the effect of the immunotherapy. Yeah, because the idea of the immunotherapy obviously is to trigger the immune system to become active versus chemo. You know, you, you have like a, an opposite uh, impact. There's more for to oxidize and kill. So. So that that's why you you alternate you know how to do the diet. Well, we alternate uh, now because the um, the fasting and also the fasting making diet cause a temporary but small uh, decrease in certain types of, of uh, white blood cells, and um, you know that's not a problem because the body is used to it. But if in that moment you're trying to to have a heavy attack on cancer cells. And you uh, impair even a little bit the uh, the effect of the immune system. Uh, now you could have a problem. Now, it's it, we're doing lots of work in mice and and, and uh, humans. Uh, so eventually we we may change our minds. Right? There may be that it's exactly what we need. Right? There may be that we need to we put it together. But until um, until we have clear data saying that you can you can combine it like we do for chemo, and that works, um, then, um, you know, then we say probably if you keep it separate, you're not going to interfere with the effect of, of uh, immunotherapy, and, and that we already achieved a big goal, which is don't interfere with the standard of care. Yeah. And then uh, hopefully then by doing it um, in between, then we, we boost the, the effect of the immune cells. Yeah, of the therapy and in between, yeah. And so and, and you were talking about vegetables and, and like inflammatory bowel disease and IBS and, and all those kind of things and Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. Uh, are, are these vegetables, I would assume they're not raw that you're eating them because a lot of times the gut lining is very inflamed and irritated. Uh, or or do, you, do you do raw along with those diets? No, no, those are not, uh, those are not raw. Um, and, uh, and for those diseases, we have a very special, uh, composition. So we went and picked, uh, ingredients, all of which have minimal pro-inflammatory or no pro-inflammatory effects. So it's a little bit tougher, but, uh, we're going to do it, uh, I think once for seven days, once every two months. And, um, yeah, so then, um, uh, we paid particular attention to the, uh, inflam the potential inflammatory effects of, of vegetables and any other ingredient for the matter uh, and make sure that we come up with things that don't have those properties. And for for a patient wanting to learn more, I mean, there, there's so many people struggling with disease out there and, and wanting to learn more in regards to the fasting mimic diet and how they can benefit uh, it would be then to to buy the books, or are there other resources that they that they can use? Yeah, buy the book, uh, the first book, the Longevity Diet, 
And then soon enough, I think within a month or so, uh, we should be opening the clinic in Los Angeles. It's going to have top doctors. Um, it's going to have uh, nutrition dietitians. It's going to have molecular biologists, um, et cetera. So, yeah, we welcome people to come and, and visit the clinic. We'll, we try to, you know, keep it as low cost as possible. But, um, you know, we, we really want to eventually focus on those that have the biggest problems. And um, and that's what we're going to try to do. So that uh, um, you know, and lots of people come, especially if we can um, uh, charge the insurance uh, uh, and uh, for the treatment. I think we're going to be able to uh, progressively treat more and more patients, and um, you know, and, and try to um, really strategize. Yeah, we think that that that's really that's missing that part of of what we do in the lab when we do animal studies, missing for the patient. And, and I think that uh, that could make a, a, a very big difference. And, you know, I'm not just saying it. I think we're, we, we see it in the clinical trials we're performing so that, um, you know, eventually we want to get that as quickly as possible to patients without having to wait for, you know, 12 year, you know, 2,000 people trials. Um, and, but at the same time, without, you know, violating any rules, and so that's the tricky uh, territory that we're, uh, or domain that we're navigating. No, I think it's very refreshing that uh, uh, research is being done in something so important in how to how to use diet then and address all these different chronic uh, conditions that people are dealing with. I I really appreciate you being on the show with me today, Dr. Longo. And I, I, I'm grateful for everything that you do in, in, in these areas. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. That is it for today. You're, you're listening to HealthMade Radio. Remember to check us out at healthmade.co. Health is what you make it. Health is what you make it. Health is what you make it.